So, hi everybody, and welcome to the Mac the Street Street podcast. Uh, we're welcome you back with some of my brothers, Osama and Sally, as usual. And um, before we start, again, the usual introduction where we urge you all to kindly subscribe and give a five star review whenever you can, and, and perhaps even write a little review um, on the podcast and in the YouTube video channel as well. That would be greatly appreciated. Uh, we've also, as we've mentioned before several times, we've started this Patreon, um, and we encourage you all to sign up if you are able to do so, and the link is in the episode description, and we have occasionally some bonus content um, for for those who, are, who do sign up to the Patreon. So we thank you for all of that. Today, uh, we're really, really happy to, to, have, to be joined by uh, Elham Fakhru who is a research fellow at the Institute of Arab and Islamic Studies at Exeter University and uh, the author of what's going to be an amazing book. And it's coming out in the fall of 2024. And it's entitled The Abraham Accords, The Gulf States, Israel, and the Limits of Normalization, uh, which we're going to talk about, obviously, in, in some detail in terms of the topics. She previously was a lecturer at the uh, NYU Abu Dhabi and uh, served for a couple of years at the, as a senior analyst for the Gulf states at the International Crisis Group. Uh, she holds an LLM from Harvard Law School and a PhD from Oxford University. And I might add, uh, she was for a while as an undergraduate at AUB, at the American University in Beirut, where I teach now. So, Elham, welcome. And uh, we're looking forward to this discussion where we're going to talk, focus especially on what's going on in the Gulf states and, uh, and, and you know, the focus eventually on uh, the views of the Gulf and what's going on vis-a-vis -vis the Gaza genocide and the kind of larger question of Palestine. So, ahlan wa sahlan, alham. Ahlan, thank you, Karim. It's great to be with all of you guys. So, to, to, to start, as we, as we would, you know, normally like to do, we'd like to just ask you about you know, your own sort of personal journey to studying politics, to studying the Middle East, to studying and focusing on the Gulf, especially. And, and perhaps over the years, through your study and through your interaction, since you are from the Gulf, you're from Bahrain, how, how, how that relationship has changed. So you're studying it from outside, maybe in the US and UK. Um, how, how have things, and you've, 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 you've analyzed it through the International Crisis Group and through your academic and policy work. So how has that changed over time? And, and, you know, any, like, what is your journey in this sense? Sure. I and mean, that's a great question. So to go back, um, kind of way back, uh, you, you remember that around almost 20 years ago, I was your student at AUB. Um, you taught me my first introduction to political science class, uh, which was great. Um, but continuing from there, I was always one of those students that wasn't quite sure what I wanted to do. Was it politics? Was it law? So I actually ended up finishing my undergrad in law. Um, I transferred over to the UK thinking, let me, let me be a lawyer. I pursued that path for a little while, did my LLM in law, even tried to practice as a lawyer, but just could not find myself uh, being interested in it. It just was clearly not what I wanted to do. Um, so to jump forward a little bit, I went ahead and did my PhD, my DPhil, um, focusing on the Middle East, focusing on the Gulf a little bit more. Um, from then on, I went to NYU Abu Dhabi. I taught as an academic. And in between all this, I had stints at think tanks, uh, at research organizations. Um, and then by 2019, 2020, I did join Crisis Group as their Gulf analyst. And this is what brought me to kind of working directly in the policy world. Um, at the time when the Abraham Accords were signed, I was working with that organization. And it really did give me this opportunity to speak with policymakers in the Gulf about the Accords. And this, you know, it really, really, you know, hit my, it piqued my interest as a Bahraini, as a, as a Gulf national, as somebody interested in the region, to suddenly see these normalization agreements unfold um, was both interesting and surprising. Um, I don't think anyone could have predicted this happening. And when it did happen, it was just such a, Surprise for everybody. Um, I immediately wanted this to become my area of focus. So another year went by and I had applied for a fellowship at Exeter, um, knowing that I wanted to write the book based on some of the fieldwork I had carried out with Crisis Group. And so when I got the fellowship, that's what I started to do. Um, and I spent the last two years writing it. I've been teaching as well. And uh, hopefully it's going to be out in, in September. It's really an overview of the relationship between 
the Gulf states and Palestine, but also Israel. I was curious to understand when this relationship began, how and why did it begin? And you do hear very different narratives. So if you talk to or you, if you hear anything on the Israeli side, what they'll tell you is, you know what, we've always had relations with the Gulf states, with the Arab states. They've always been there. They've always been under the table. Um, and I was curious to know, is this really true? Um, and to what extent might it be true? And I think when you do look into the relationship, actually, it's not that straightforward. Initially, it, it, for a very long time, it actually ebbed and flowed uh, in relationship with progress on Palestinian statehood. And only much later on were the two decoupled from one another um, in response to a series of events and developments. So, yeah, that's kind of my the short story of, of my uh, journey into all of this. That's great. And, and if I can ask, I know you're... If it's okay to ask, I know your dad also studied at AUB. And I bring this up not by way of just, you know, it, it's also because I think for many of us, uh, especially the younger generation, they're unaware of this more kind of closer interlinking between, you know, people in the Gulf and, and people in the in the Meshire and the Levant. And so, you know, you, the, especially your dad's generation and my parents' generation, the, the things were much closer, right? And how, what, what is that relationship? And how did that impact you in a sense? You ended up going. Absolutely. This is, a, it's a really interesting relationship. Um, I think we tend to think of things nowadays as one-sided in terms of uh, people from the Levant working in the Gulf, you know, as expats and as people who very much built the Gulf. But the relationship very much, uh, you know, it, it ran in the other way too. Um, so for this earlier generation of Gulf technocrats, doctors, engineers, uh, many of them went to AUB, trained in AUB, studied in AUB, and became politicized in AUB. So what happened in the 50s, 60s, you had these groups of you know, students who were sent by their governments from Kuwait, from Bahrain, on scholarships to places like AUB. And that became not only their source of education, but their initial exposure to politics uh, and to ideology, to the ideologies of Arab nationalism, socialism, Ba'athism. And so they came back to the Gulf with these ideals and integrated them into their work, but also uh, set the stage for kind of these early political movements that we've had in the region, which were very much influenced by these currents and specifically by students who came back from places like AUB. In fact, Ilham, if I could ask about that, again, for the benefit of our viewers or listeners, our audience, um, people, I mean, I don't know how much people know about this, but in general, uh, you know, there was a colonial presence in the Gulf, like an active colonial presence in the Gulf, the British specifically, until relatively late in the whole sort of post-colonial, you know, experience, right? It was there into the 60s and 70s even, right? So can you can you talk through, because like what that means is that, you know, for people in your father's generation, or our parents' generation, I don't know, you know, I don't know what that means exactly, but let's say the 50s, for example, the much of the Gulf, I mean, people, places like Lebanon would have been independent and Syria and, you know, but places in the Gulf would still have been under directly under British control, uh, including all the way over to Yemen and so forth, right? So, like, it's so just walk us through what what that would have meant for somebody coming from the Gulf to an independent Arab state, and then obviously going back to whatever Gulf country they come from. I think that's that's a great point. Um, the British were in the Gulf until they withdrew between the years 1968 to 71 and that was uh, that that was when we became independent states at least in the in the case of, with the exception of saudi of course but kuwait uh, what are today the uae the arab emirates bahrain amman these countries didn't get their independence until pretty late um and so yeah exactly during those years in the 50s and 60s when you had students coming over to lebanon they were very much you know, inspired by this this rhetoric of Arab nationalism and anti-colonialism, this idea that the Arab countries should, and Arab people should unite under uh, sort of an, an anti-colonial framework. Uh, they should be should be greater cooperation between them, of course, uh, and that um, a kind of a, a socialist alternative uh, might be possible. But these were the, these were the dominant ideals that inspired these students that came from the Gulf, and of course, much of the anti-colonial rhetoric that that came out uh, ahead of uh, independence was was taken from uh, not only Lebanon, but very much Egypt as well, um, places, Syria. Um, and you had, you know, it, it's much broader than that. Um, when the British were sort of unhappy with uh, certain figures who were leading these anti-colonial movements, which of course we did have, they would be exiled to, uh, to, the, to Yemen, to Syria, to places like that. And so... Even exile is, is another kind of 
way that these things were intertwined um, with each other. Uh, Ilham, so just to, to, to kind of continue this, this discussion of this relationship, um, it's kind of social, in a sense, relations between what's going on in the Gulf and, let's say, the Mashra, Lebanon, Palestine, these areas, Egypt. Um, there, there's, there, at a certain point, there's a bit of a rupture, right? I mean, is it the Gulf War, obviously, in, in, a, in places like Kuwait, certainly, and others, there seems to be this rupture where, uh, or I mean, this is a question, where th- does the question of Palestine do the whole Mesh area, the Palestinians in particular, who are evicted you know, from Kuwait as a result of the, the 1990 Gulf War, what is it that's, how, how does that uh, you know, relationship kind of continue? And you know, there's, there, there's much less transfer, there's much less, fewer people going from, or you know, going from, the technical people going from, places like Bahrain and Kuwait and these things to Lebanon, to Palestine, and vice versa, because workers are also being kicked out. So what, how, does that, how does that change over that, that period? So I think, you know, to talk about this period, I think I do want to connect it back to the question of Palestine historically. Um, even before 1948, there was this awareness of, of Palestine uh, in the Gulf. Um, so when... The state of Israel was was created or, or was announced to, to or plans to create the state of Israel. There were protests in Bahrain from schoolboys and workers, and this is well documented in the British archives, um, protesting the create the planned creation of the state of Israel. Um, and I think the connection there is very clear. This was seen as a colonial project that was infringing itself upon the Arab world. And to Bahrainis living under colonial dominance, they could easily see the link between themselves and between the Palestinians. So that kind of solidarity um, continued in the following decades. It continued in the 50s and 60s. Even as these countries were living under the British, they would look to the Palestinians and say, you know what, this is one of the worst effects of British colonialism, and we need to rid ourselves of the British, of the French. The entire region needs to free itself from this colonial influence. Now, if we take this you know, to the Gulf War, that is definitely a period of rupture. Um, but I, would, I wouldn't I would exaggerate its impact. I think if you were looking at Kuwait, then definitely you would see the impact in terms of the Palestinians who were kicked out of Kuwait. I mean, by the time of, of the Gulf War, um, the numbers of Palestinians residing in Kuwait were, were coming up close to the numbers of Kuwaitis. Um, so I don't have the exact figures off the top of my head, but if you can imagine the Palestinian population being nearly equivalent to the, to the Kuwaiti population. And of course, um, the specific issue that happened at the time was um, Yasser Arafat's refusal to kind of condemn Saddam's invasion of Kuwait, uh, causing the Kuwaiti leadership to be extremely offended and upset and having the sense that, you know, we, we've opened our doors to the Palestinians as we believe in their cause. And now their leadership is, is sort of, uh, you know, treating us this way. Um, so there was a backlash. Palestinians were evicted from Kuwait. Um, of course, a massive, massive backlash. Um, and the rest of the Gulf, I think the state leaders sided with the Kuwaitis, of course, but there wasn't a similar kind of eviction of the Palestinians across the rest of the region because this was very much seen as an issue with the Palestinian leadership. They're, they didn't want to be this kind of reprisal against the Palestinian populations, of course, which are much, much smaller, but still you did have those populations residing in Saudi Arabia and Bahrain and other countries like that. Now, the distance between the Gulf War and the Second Intifada is about 10 years. And I think that's the time period when a lot happens, but maybe that relationship is for a few years at at a low point, 92, 93, but then it picks up again. It picks up during the Oslo Accords, and there's um, a lot of optimism towards the creation of a Palestinian state. I don't want to give you the impression that, you know, this really hardened sentiment towards the Palestinian population among Khalijis, among Gulf nationals. It didn't. There was still tremendous sympathy for their side and tremendous, you know, support for what, what at the time was believed to be, you know, the, the, the two state solution that would resolve everything. Um, and I think if you look at sort of where mobilization picked up again in support of the Palestinians in the Gulf, definitely with the Second Intifada, it did. Um, that's when you saw, again, an outbreak of protests in their favor um, and real an outpour of public sympathy, not only from populations, but also in the media. If you look at any of the, of the Gulf newspapers around that time, you would have seen the kind of coverage towards Palestine that you're seeing today now. Ilham, sorry, can we just go back just to that moment in the 60s? I, don't, cause I know we're going to come back to the present pretty quickly. So just before we leave it too far behind. <clears throat> particularly with reference to Kuwait, I mean, you pointed out, you know, that after after Arafat took, he didn't condemn the Iraqi invasion of Kuwait in, in 19, 
90, um, the, obviously they lost, you know, they, they were, they were out of favor in Kuwait, but until then, I don't remember the exact numbers, maybe Osama and Kenny, maybe you guys know this or Ilham, maybe, you know, but I, but I know there was a lot of support from Kuwait for the PLO, a lot of funding as well, May, and not just for the PLO, for other, for other Palestinian initiatives too, but especially the PLO all through the 1970s and eighties. And obviously Arafat threw that out. was one of his great own goals. You know, he threw that out as well. Um, but there had been, so in other words, I mean, it just speaks to what you're saying that there was, there had been a great deal of support, particularly in Kuwait. I mean, I don't know elsewhere in the Gulf too, but I know for sure in Kuwait, which is, which is, which is striking. We, and we, it's true. We tend to, we, we tend to forget that moment of the 60s, 70s, 80s in, in light of what's been happening more recently, but, but that history is still there and it still speaks to us. And there's also lurking further in the background. There's, you know, the great Hassan Kanafani story, Men in the Sun, which is set at the border between Iraq and Kuwait, which also speaks to that that sort of ge- that that territorial location in in the narrative of Palestine as well, which is a somewhat different thing. But but just to go back to that 60s, 70s moment and the sense of affiliation between the Gulf countries and Palestine, I think it's it's very powerful, right? Absolutely. So there's there's a lot you could point to to kind of give you evidence of Gulf support uh, for the Palestinians among state leaders and, and among populations. So if you're looking at aid and, and financial donations, there were two concurrent tracks of, of, of aid and, and money flowing to the Palestinians from the Gulf states. The first is to, directly to UNRWA. Uh, and the, the kind of figure that comes to the top of my head was is the year is 1968. And that's when Abu Dhabi began making its donations to UNRWA when it was not even part, it was not even, you know, part of this or the leader of the UAE as such, it was donating as Abu Dhabi. And then in the years after that, uh, once the UAE united into a federation, they continued their, their donations to UNRWA. Saudi at the time was one of the largest, if not the largest donors to, to UNRWA. And, and, you know, they all also provided donations to the PLO when that was created, um, you had diplomatic initiatives as well. So the King Faisal initiative, again, was one of those very early initiatives actually coming out of the Gulf um, to try to push for a Palestinian state. Um, and it was kind of the precursor to the Arab peace initiative. So even Saudi Arabia very early on was playing this diplomatic role. So you could see the Gulf states in all of these ways by opening their doors to the Palestinians, um, by proposing these diplomatic initiatives, by providing support to UNRWA and the PLO, uh, these are all very, very clear, tangible ways in which you could see Gulf leaders and populations really try to lend their support to a cause which I would say they unanimously cared about and believed in. Um, Sheikh Zayed himself is a, a very good example. If you look into the history of Sheikh Zayed as a leader, this is something he took very seriously. Later on in his life, he would go on to fund Sheikh Zayed city in Gaza, um, which was a a housing uh, camp of, of multiple, multiple apartment buildings to house Palestinian refugees who had become refugees, you know, as you know, f- from 1948, then, then come into Gaza as refugees. So there are all kinds of initiatives like this uh, that can show you kind of the relationship they had with the Palestinians. Not to mention, I'll add one more, uh, participating in the Arab boycott of Israel, the three-tiered Arab boycott, which eventually, you know, became watered down somewhat. But for many years, they were ardent supporters of the, of the boycott. You, there's no way you would find anything made in Israel in the Gulf. Um, and if you had corporations that were also working in Israel, there'd be kind of a question mark around that too. Also, there's a long, uh, there's a, long, a very long history of, of course, the movement of Arab nationalists were in the Gulf. There is in Kuwait and Bahrain and other places, you know, in Oman, in, in so many different areas, there was extraordinary sort of as you say, identification at a popular level with Palestine, with Arab nationalism, with anti-colonialism throughout this region that we tend to forget about. And but I guess the, this leads us, I guess, to it. To it, isn't there? A, I mean, don't we have to make a distinction between this extraordinary popular sentiment on behalf or sort of sort of identification with Palestine, both as an Arab and as an Islamic and anti-colonial sort of cause? as opposed to it, governments, which ultimately, as you say, were first under a British umbrella and then increasingly under a US umbrella. Isn't there a distinction to be made between that sort of popular, I guess, reservoir of, of, uh, of just of, of, of natural, I would say, or, or instinctive solidarity, as opposed to governments that ultimately 
do. I mean, you, you mentioned King Faisal, you mentioned others. These are governments that ultimately are under a U.S. umbrella and have to make certain choices and do make certain choices, often at the expense of the Palestinians. How do you how do you how do you move us from the 60s, 50s and 60s onwards? I think I would argue that initially you didn't have to make that distinction. Um, it's true that they were under the U.S. umbrella. They remain so. But they were able to balance this on the one hand with their relationship with the, with the Palestine and supporting the Palestinians. They were able to kind of attempt to balance both and did so to some extent successfully. And I, I mean, I can point you to other things such as, you know, uh, Abu Dhabi offering, you know, aid during the 1973 war. Uh, so more specific things like that. At times, there were behind the scenes effort to try to encourage the Americans to adopt a more neutral position. Um, I think King Faisal as well had tried to had really tried to do that, obviously with no success. So I would actually make the distinction between the sort of first or earlier generation of Gulf leaders that really, you know, it went, you know expended considerable effort to support the Palestinians and sort of what we're seeing now, which is these governments playing a very different role than, than historically what they used to. Uh, Ilham, based sort of just following up on this. So so this, this distinction, even historically between, you're saying that historically there's not this big difference between the kind of the Gulf leaders, let's say, and people, and there was a vis-a-vis -a -vis Palestine, and they, there was a there was a kind of interlinkages historically and, and other nationalist kind of things that spilled towards support for the Palestinians. Uh, you you kind of broke off at a certain point at the second Intifada, then you know. Just, so there's a Gulf War that doesn't spread, according to what you're saying, doesn't really spread beyond Kuwait too much. Uh, there's then, but you know, still popular support for the Palestinians up until the second Intifada, where there's more support because of the uh, presumably the attacks as well on the Aqsa Mosque and others. So wh where is it, at what point is there, or is there, I mean, a rupture? Or, or maybe there isn't, maybe this is just like looking from the outside, there appears to be some kind of rupture, and it could be, and then, you know, we're going to have to get to the leadership where a new generation of leaders do come in and sort of may maybe those, that younger generation doesn't have the social cultural ties and they don't come to Lebanon and go to, you know, they don't do these kinds of things anymore. So they don't particularly have any uh, personal vested emotions or anything else towards people in the Mashri and in Palestine. Where, where is that rupture or, did, or am I, is it a figment of my imagination? No, this is absolutely right. Um, so the way I think of it is there is more or less this continuity from sort of 1948 going through the decades. That continuity is there. Um, again, not perfectly so, right? Um, but it's it's more or less there. Gulf leaders are largely supportive of the Palestinians. There isn't really a relationship with Israel. There are tiny moments where there are transactional instances of, of, of what you might call cooperation, but they are extremely transactional and maybe beyond the scope of, of this conversation. Where things start to change and really pick up, um, I would say, is the year 2006. Um, now, I talk about in my book about there being two waves of Gulf normalization with Israel. The first wave takes place in the mid-90s around Oslo, and I think it's important to anchor it to Oslo because there is widespread optimism in the Arab world um, that there is going to be a two-state solution and, and that we're going to move past this. Um, and so this is a moment at which three Gulf states start to kind of have you know, overtures or, or open up to Israel in certain ways. Um, the first one is Amman, which starts to make plans to open up a trade office with Israel. This is in the mid-90s. Again, linked to Oslo, linked to there being a Palestinian state. Qatar is the other one that starts to make plans again for opening a trade office. Um, several Israelis are invited onto Al Jazeera. Um, others are invited to attend this kind of economic conference. And it's really seen as laying the groundwork for uh, a normalization process. Um, and the other country is the UAE. So UAE officials also start to have conversations with Israeli counterparts around acquiring these jets from the United States. Um, but all of these three processes are seen as linked to progress on Palestinian statehood, and that's what's crucial. When that you know, falls through and you have the outbreak of the Second Intifada, all of these initiatives roll back. So Qatar and Oman both shut their trade offices. Um, the UAE, as far as we're aware, that conversation becomes a one-off and there isn't this kind of follow-up in terms of normalization. 
Uh, and, you know, as the Second Intifada progresses, and even in the years afterwards, there isn't that kind of cooperation between the Gulf states and Israel. Where things pick back up again, very crucially, is the year 2006. What happens in the year 2006? There are, I think, two main trends we, we look at. One is the, the start of Iran's nuclear program. Um, it's when it announces its plans to, to sort of break out and establish a program, which, of course, alarms Gulf leaders to the extent where they again, look at Israel and think, maybe we need to start having conversations and, and start thinking about working with, with Israel. And I would say this is true of, of, of three Gulf countries, really. It's Saudi Arabia, the UAE, and Bahrain. Um, the other, the other uh, event that takes place in that year is the conflict between Hezbollah and Israel, again, where Hezbollah comes out as effectively victorious. And this, again, raises a question mark for Gulf leaders in those three countries, um, they start to think, okay, they start to realize that Iran is, you know, it's growing as a regional power, and this might be a cause for concern. Uh, at the same time, you're right to identify the rise of a new generation of Gulf leaders, which is absolutely crucial to all of this, um, particularly in the UAE and Bahrain. You have a new leadership that is less committed to ideals of Arab nationalism. Again, this is partly a function of their education. So while they're, you know, you had the earlier generation that was perhaps more connected or aware of the broader Arab milieu. This newer generation is, sees itself as more connected or, or maybe, yeah, I would say more connected to the United States, actually. They view that relationship as more important. They view that relationship as a key to their survival. And I think this is when things really start to turn. Um, if you look at you know, what's present in the WikiLeaks documents, for example, around 2006 is the year when these conversations start to begin between Gulf diplomats, um, there is really counterparts and U.S. officials. They start to be involved in these sort of triangular conversations around Iran, around how to how to contain the threat from Iran. And you know whether or not that's an accurate perception, whether or not this kind of real fear of of, of Iran as a power is is justified or merited. I think regardless of that, this is what becomes front and center in their thinking. It's what occupies, I would say, the most space in their thinking. And it's then what starts to inform and shape uh, their thinking around Palestine and, and the Israelis, yeah. Ilham, sorry, a couple of questions to follow up on that. So just, just to be clear, so what you're saying, what you're drawing for us and for our, our listeners and our viewers is that you're saying that there was an almost a, an embarrassed or tentative beginnings of normalization in the Oslo period. And then it became a more aggressive after 2006 for both the, you're saying, the Iran nuclear factor on the one hand, and on the other hand, the uh, obviously there's the Iraq war, the US invasion of Iraq and its after and its effects, and as well as the, the Israeli assault on Lebanon in 2006 and the war with Hezbollah in 2006. And then we can get to, we're going to get to the Abraham Accords, which, where it becomes just more vulgar. But the, couple of, before we get to the, the, the current situation, Let's go back. Let's stick to the 1990s and also the 2000s, since you mentioned those. It seems to me how how do you how do you tell our viewers and listeners to to distinguish between what is ultimately U.S. policy? The U.S. is the major hegemon in the Gulf region after the in the 1990s. Uh, you know, after the Iranian Revolution, the U.S. starts sending its fleets. It's you know, it's uh, Bahrain becomes the isn't Bahrain the the uh, the fifth fleet, the headquarters of the fifth fleet. There is also a massive U.S. military buildup in the Gulf in the run-up to the first and second Gulf Wars. There is a, there is a U.S. policy which is to basically to delink Palestine from the, the architecture of U.S. domination, which is basically you have despotisms in the Gulf and the Arab world, you have Israel, and you have up until the Iranian Revolution, the Shah of Iran, another despot. And so I'm wondering how how do you tell how do you as a scholar or, or as a as a researcher how do you distinguish U.S. policy and its extraordinarily negative effects and its basic anti-Palestinian direction with what you're describing as a, a generational shift in Gulf leadership on the one hand and with Gulf leaders themselves and their own interests? And then a third point, Gulf, the people, the, the peoples of, the, of, of Bahrain you know, and and um, Oman and others who, who, where there are actually, and Saudi Arabia, of course, and Kuwait, where there actually are peoples. Okay, so I, I think this is a good point. Um, I think we have to understand, you know, U.S. influence on this relationship for sure, but I also do look at the Gulf states as 
to some extent, having some autonomy. Otherwise, if they hadn't had some kind of even, you know, whatever on whatever scale you want to put it, if there hadn't been some autonomy, then what you would have seen from the very beginning, from the 60s and 70s, is them being perfectly aligned with the U.S. on Israel. And that didn't happen. and It wasn't the case. That only began shifting, as I described, in, in 2006. Um, and I think to various U.S. administrations, there was an understanding or an acceptance of the fact that this is where these Arab states stand. Uh, you know, they are supportive of the Palestinians. Uh, this is where their, their policy is. And yes, the, the Fifth Fleet is here. And yes, these are U.S. allies. But there is a difference when it comes to this. Um, it wasn't until, I think, again, the mindset among leaders began changing where you really had this turn towards normalization. As I described, what took place in the 90s was very much anchored to Palestinian statehood. And the fact that, you know, the Oslo Accords collapsed, didn't work out, whatever you want to call it. The fact that this prompted the rollback of normalization is, is indicative, I think, of some autonomy and, and, and some independent policymaking going on in these capitals. Otherwise, you would not have seen that. Um, what you saw is its resurgence again at a time when the leadership uh, changed. And I think we, what what you can, you know, if you'd want to explain this uh, in sort of a different way, is you can say that, yes, around 2006 was when they became sort of more willing to lean into U.S. pressure on the issue. If you want to think of it that way, then, then, then you could. Um, those pressures sort of became more effective around 2006 because the leadership saw that as being directly in their interest. Uh, there wasn't that friction that you had with the first generation. And what I was going to say was, I don't want to overstate the kind of cultural dimension, but it is it is so striking when we hear, you know, the kind of narrative about education too. Because And so what's interesting is that that earlier generation, I mean, I don't know all of it, but I mean, a lot of it certainly goes to places like Beirut for education, right? Because, and AUB in particular. So there's this kind of, Beirut and Lebanon is sort of an anchor in that way that ties the people, especially the elites of the Gulf, to the question of to Arab nationalism in general and the question of Palestine in particular. And then what's interesting, of course, is that the the you know the gradual well this obviously the civil war in Lebanon and then the gradual destruction of Beirut as as the central hub of the region in banking and financial terms, and of course the rise of the Gulf as especially places like Bahrain, in fact, as as a you know, as a, as a as a kind of alternative to Beirut in terms of economic development, banking, finance, all that kind of stuff, um, leads it also because a kind of in other words, there's a sort of subtext here of the decline of the centrality of Beirut, both in terms of education and in terms of banking and finance, and and that's also part of the shift we're talking about here. Because then later on, by the time we get to the to the 2000s that generation of Gulf leaders is no longer going to Beirut. They no longer see this, the centrality of Beirut in all of these narratives, whether the financial ones or the political ones. And now they're looking, I don't know where they go to school, I mean, to, at the university, but presumably they're looking more to the West at this point, or, or they, of course, their development, there's the development of, of local universities in the various Gulf countries too. But I, I don't know, just, I don't know what to do with that other than it's an interesting kind of subtext of this whole story that we're talking about too. It is. And I think, you know, this this is kind of we can tie this into the shift as well. I think, you know, for the Gulf states in, in, in the 90s or, or 80s to not be kind of on board with Israel, uh, despite being close U.S. partner states, I think was not a huge issue for the United States because these, this is not the center of gravity of the Arab world. These were, you know, peripheral actors and they supplied oil and oil for security and all of that. But you didn't need them to be on board necessarily. They were seen as peripheral. It's very different now when they are not at all peripheral uh, to, to the Arab world, um, precisely because of the decline of Beirut and, and places like that. So maybe this is another way to, to understand you know, the, the, how this region has become so central, whereas in the past it, it really wasn't. Well, except Saudi Arabia. I mean, you can't say Saudi Arabia is, is, not peri is, is peripheral. I know. I'm not saying that. Uh, I mean, I mean, Bahrain, UAE. Is, is oh, so can, can I just push you, Ilham, can I push a little bit back on this question of the, the first phase, the 1990s phase, where you talked about, we discussed this embarrassed form of normalization. Can you give us a sense of, of how, I mean, do we have any archives or records or you've done interviews maybe or something, some sense of how they themselves, you know, at the time, how, how did they articulate it to their own, you know, in terms of their own publics, to their own uh, 
to the even within the the discourse of Bahraini, for example, national security or whatever, whatever, whatever the terms are. How did they actually? What term, did they try to convince their own publics, or was it just something that? How, how do you get to? How do you get to that archives or that sense of what was happening? What was happening was the beginning of a kind of opening up. Uh, the beginning of a normalization process, which again was linked to Palestinian statehood, and that's how it was always justified and talked about and thought about. And again, you know, it it wasn't, it hadn't yet been born. So these trade offices were not yet thriving and flourishing or anything like that. They had just been in the kind of the very early stages. And I think the point is, it wasn't as as embarrassed as as kind of you might think because it was linked to. Uh, to, to Palestinian statehood. The idea being that this is going to work out, you'll have a Palestinian state, and so we're going to begin to normalize. Um, but again, I think you would have had to have these kind of bigger explanations had these initiatives continued into their later stages, but they didn't. And so we don't know. So assuming that I'm, you know, it, it, no, as, as we move along, when I want to ask, of course, about the Abraham Accords, which I'm assuming, you know, runs counter to this narrative. So it's not the... Oslo sort of allows, or I mean, at least in principle, or at least as marketed, would have allowed for a Palestinian state. So that would allow people in the Gulf and other parts of the Arab world to say, okay, well, if they're doing it, then you know we're going to start building this way. And then when that clearly kind of shuts down or breaks down, you're saying that so, so did the trade offices in Qatar and Oman and these kinds of places also shut down. Later, in the, it, so, so, so Iran and, and the role Iran plays for the at least as far as the Gulf is concerned, is or at least the Gulf leaders are concerned, is the kind of is as you're saying kind of the turning point where there starts to be a, a clear what appears to be a very clear separation between still I assume public support for Palestinians at least in principle for Palestine for the question of Palestine and for Palestinians in general versus a much sharper sense of national interest or even kind of sort of GCC, combined GCC interest, which now shifts, you know, totally towards whatever role Iran might or might not play in the region. And so therefore, throwing its lot even more into the American basket, which therefore means the Israeli basket for security, for for what appears to be security. So, you know, you end up in this kind of, is this right? Am I reading this correctly from you? Yeah, that's exactly right. Um, so this, you know, 2006 is a turning point for, for all of these reasons um, that, we, that we mentioned. And this is where um, this idea that, you know, sort of acquiring technology from Israel might be useful, being in conversation with Israel might be useful. And it's oriented, interestingly enough, at the very beginning, it's oriented towards the United States, towards convincing the U.S. to take a, a, a tougher stance or convincing the Obama administration specifically to take a tougher stance on Iran. Um, you know, several Gulf policymakers or decision makers speak candidly with their Israeli counterparts saying, look, we find the Obama administration being too soft on Iran and we want to kind of work together to send a message to Washington that, look, your main regional partners and allies are united on seeing things this way and we want you to, to listen to us effectively. So this is one of the kind of the earliest drivers of, of when they kind of come, they come together in Washington around this shared idea that that Obama has things wrong. Um, that even later on, this idea of having an Iran nuclear deal is a terrible idea. And obviously, in Netanyahu, the Gulf states find a very willing and active champion um, against the Iran nuclear deal, and he, his opposition to that and, and willingness to kind of push that in Washington is something that they view as, as you know, useful to their interests. And I say the Gulf states, I, I really mean the UAE, Bahrain, and Saudi Arabia. It's those three. Um, but this is how the relationship builds in those years. Um, in the UAE, it becomes about acquiring technology from Israel early on. So um, things like uh, satellite data. So Israel has, an Israeli company has, uh, you know, releases uh, satellites to sort of... Uh, obtain images of Iran's nuclear program. And this is one of the earliest areas of cooperation between the two countries. Um, later on, this expands over time, but it's it's oriented towards technology, acquiring uh, the kind of intelligence systems uh, that they see as useful in, in, in learning more about uh, Iran and its nuclear program. Um, 
some of this back, back channel diplomacy. At the same time in the UAE, I think they also find Israel to be useful in, in other ambitions. So the UAE is looking to, to acquire civilian nuclear technology. They have conversations with Israelis around sort of t- telling them, you know, don't block us from having this in Washington. We, we, we want, you know, we want your, uh, we want the go ahead from you guys. Uh, don't lobby against us in Washington. And then, you know, shortly after that, uh, the U.S. is supportive of, of the UAE acquiring civilian nuclear capabilities. Um, so it's, it's, it's things like that. You know, you have these bits and pieces um, where they come together in acquiring technology. They come together um, around the UAE's own ambitions um, for nuclear energy. Uh, there's a coming together certainly around the JCPOA and well before that, even on the Arab Spring. So that's another driver in the relationship um, is basically when you have Morsi come to government in Egypt, for example, the Gulf states are totally freaked out about this, um, this idea of a Muslim Brotherhood government in Egypt, uh, strengthening that ideology across the region is something that they view as a threat. And so does Israel, of course. So again, this pushes the two sides closer together. So you have this convergence taking place pretty much between 2006 into the next decade around these factors, around the Arab Spring, and this idea that the Obama administration doesn't know what it's doing. It's supporting the wrong actors. We don't want to see political Islam grow as a force in the region. They're united on that front. They're united in seeing the JCPOA, the Iran nuclear deal, as something of a mistake. For the Gulf states, again, they have more specific concerns that this doesn't address Iran's missile program and it doesn't address its regional role. But they very much do see eye to eye with Netanyahu around this being misguided, around this giving Iran uh, you know, a, a breath of fresh air, which it's going to use to kind of grow its influence. Uh, they're united in wanting to acquire technology from Israel um, and seeing Israel as a useful partner in Washington. That's also key. It's not just sort of, I think we think of it the other way around. We always think of it as the U.S. pushing the Gulf states to normalize with Israel. But sometimes, in some instances, it's actually the complete reverse. They see Israel as a very useful partner to getting their message across in Washington. And this is another accelerant of the relationship. But that's because, Ilham, that's because of U.S. policy. In other words, it's U.S. policy that's made Israel the most, you know, the, the key client or the key, the key state in the region. And then the other states have to react to that. But can we go back to this thing? You, since you mentioned the Arab, the Arab Spring 2011, and you, you described it as a fear of, of the Muslim Brotherhood or a certain form of political Islam, because, of course, the Saudis have their own official brand of political Islam, um, as do as do other states in the region, isn't it more that the fact that that the Arab Spring basically what we're talking about is is the repression of democratic protests of uh, the repression of any form of democratic rule of any form of genuine sort of liberation in the Gulf region? So you know that's a key sort of intermediate as opposed to just being afraid of the the Muslim Brotherhood. There's something else going on here. There's a there's a there's a mass repression taking place across the Arab world. In fact. Uh, uh, both, you know, in North Africa, of course, in Egypt, in Tunis, uh, in Syria, and uh, across the board, this repression of democratic protests, as well as, of course, in Bahrain, most famously in 2011. And the question I have is then, how how does how do you when when you say, and Karim and I have always, often had these discussions. We talk about the UAE, you talk about Bahrain, you talk about Oman, these these smaller Gulf states, and we talk about their interests. How do you separate the dynastic interests of a ruling family? And those who are associated with the ruling family, um, from from Bahraini interest, for example, when you have an actual population that rose up in 2011 and was suppressed. Um, so I'm wondering, how does one, how would you, how would you help us navigate that? What seems to be a contradiction. There's a dynastic set of interests, and then there, and then there, uh, which of course means aligning, as you're saying, with with Israel and the U.S. against Iran as opposed to popular protests, which are being smashed in the same period. How do you separate dynastic from national interests or from popular interest for that matter? So, I mean, I think you, you touch on an interesting point, but I, I, again, I mean, I don't, I don't think each state has its domestic considerations and its regional considerations, right? And when I talk about them being worried about Egypt and developments in Egypt, that's a regional consideration for the UAE's leadership um, that is, I think, a set aside from its domestic considerations. Uh, the UAE didn't have that kind of mass mobilization that you saw in Bahrain. And so that's what I'm trying to explain here. Um, if, you're, if you're willing to see the two things as, or, or, or to accept that these two things are, are you know, they're not the same. 
Um, I haven't talked about the domestic issues yet. Um, but in terms of mass repression, I mean, again, it's, it's, I think you, this is definitely a state by state issue. Um, the UAE in its, in its uh, dealing with the Arab Spring was, was able to sidestep mass mobilization very easily. Um, Saudi Arabia had its own strategies and Bahrain is the one that had the biggest uprising. But I think, I mean, I'm trying to kind of move this away from the Abraham Accords because I think it's not quite, it's much more to me about the way the region looks and who's running the region than about their domestic considerations, which I think in the OE were, were very different. I think they were much more informed or guided by what is going on regionally than what's happening domestically. This makes sense. Uh, I, can I ask, um, someone? did you have a follow-up on this? No, 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 no. I'm just, go ahead, Kareem. I wanted to ask, you know, as well. So, in addition to this, the what, one of the, th- the shifts that's happened, you know, over the past decade or, or more, is the is you know, and and perhaps it, it's happening at the same time as, you know, when you're looking back and say, well, you know, Palestinians and others helped helped to build, you know, a number of of Gulf cities and areas, like, especially like Kuwait. Now you see something very different. You see all these McKinsey type companies, all these big companies, the big consulting companies. Uh, Tony Blair and his impact at a certain stage anyway, in places like UAE and others, where they kind of vet who comes in, who doesn't come in, as far as the foreign workers are concerned. What, what is, you know, is this, is this a product of the way the Gulf has shifted or is this part of the contributing that, that, that is part of trying to separate the Gulf from the rest of the Arab world or the Gulf from, certainly from the, from the Mashrek? And come and manufacturing, constructing new interests. So, I mean, the interest can be there, as you're explaining, and the fear of Iran on the one hand, and the fear of the Muslim Brothers on the other. Sort of that explains the 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 siege, let's say, of Qatar for two three years. It explains the kind of the tension with Turkey. It explains why the Saudis and others kind of intervened in Egypt after the uprisings there, and Mursi in Tunisia, the same thing, in Libya and other places like this even in Syria. But what, what about the role of, of this, like McKinsey companies, all these people that represent, they're not innocent, they're not objective, they're not there simply as nice technocrats who are helping to build 20, 30 visions and 20, 40 visions. What role do they play and what is their connection with the larger pol- politics of this? I think, you know, there is kind of a, an unknown when you think about who is advising at the upper level levels of policy, you know, is it, is McKinsey, you know, making the political decisions that are pushing the region forward to some extent, perhaps they're having some kind of role. But I think in general, what is understood is that uh, there is an army of kind of foreign consultants uh, that run, that run the region. They run the economic planning. They, to some extent, run policy planning, um, and I think this is, we can only understand it as a colonial relic, you know, the fact that these very, very well-paid, uh, highly connected outsiders have an outsized role in managing the direction of where things go is, I think, speaks to this kind of overconfidence that still exists in the role of the foreign expert and the role of the, of the Western expert, let's say. Um, and often what you get is policy, again, that's disconnected from from the people or from the roots of the region for, for this exact reason. There is uh, an inexplicable optimism uh, with this. Can, can you of- give us an example, Ilham, just for the reader, just like exactly on this point, can you give us just one example so that for, because I don't think all our listeners know necessarily. Yeah. So in the, in the Gulf, there is uh, what's referred to as the ministry of McKinsey. And this is basically a reference to this, this understanding that consultants, if not McKinsey itself, we don't want to just single them out, but, Teams of foreign consultants are the ones that make major, major decisions that shape the futures of these countries. And often they are decisions that many of us would see as detrimental. So, for example, in places like Bahrain, you know, healthcare is increasingly privatized. These wonderful systems of national healthcare, akin to the NHS, um, are being dismantled and, and slowly defunded piece by piece on recommendation of these sort of neoliberal uh, experts, so-called experts, um, that are making these recommendations. The same is true in education, um, whereas you once had bigger portions of, of budgets uh, towards public education that's increasingly rolled back and you have, again, like this promotion of more private educational systems um, that, again, separate people, whereas in the past, you know, you would have 
the most powerful people in the state and the kind of least powerful mixed into the same educational system and the same schools, increasingly the incentive is to have these very tiered private systems where you're segregated by class. Again, this is uh, one of these uh, changes and reforms that are recommended by institutions like, like uh, McKinsey and other consultants. So this is where, you know, I think when people understand decision making in the Gulf to be very opaque, it comes from the fact that, yes, decision makers are, are, are not elected and, and many decisions are made there, but also because they're informed by these teams of foreign consultants that have no link to the country itself um, and that are proposing many kind of new arrangements that are that many would, would oppose and, and view as unfavorable. Just just on this on this point about Mc, the role of McKinsey, and as you just finished saying now, these outside experts coming in, and I don't know enough, but maybe you maybe you could fill this in. But I I presume that the technocrats that the technocratic class in the sixties and seventies would have been more Lebanese and Palestinian. Is that right, or is that is that a stretch? Because that which is interesting too, and it just goes back to what we were saying earlier about the central how the loss of the centrality of Beirut for all of these things, not just the educational and the cultural and the political, but also now the technocratic as well. Like the the the, the, the demise of a kind of Palestinian Lebanese, you know, technocratic class in the Gulf countries and their replacement by New York, you know, where I don't know where McKinsey's from, wherever they're from, these these free floating uh, you know, capitalist enterprises that that come in and 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 give directions that suit, of course, the capitalist market, obviously not, not, not national development or anything else regionally or locally or otherwise. I don't just, I don't want to overstate that, but I wonder if that's also part of the story. here. I think it's definitely part of the story. Um, you, you know, you, you have these concurrent things going on at the same time. Um, definitely the fact that kind of where the elite study now is no longer Cairo and Beirut and Syria um, it's it's exactly it's London and New York and Washington. You end up with a system that is so anglified. Um, expertise is no longer sought after from the Arab metropoles or, or, or the centers of Arab power, the historic centers of Arab power. But it's 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 just looked at from the West, um, and so you end up with, you know. Uh, the most obvious effect of that is in, in economic development, where you end up with a very, very Western neoliberal model um, that is completely unrestrained. And there's no doubt that that filters into ideology as well. Um, when your elite classes are only speaking English, they only study abroad, they're only consuming English content. Um, I don't think they're out there reading, you know, Sharq al Awsat or Quds al Arabi or something. They're out there reading the New York Times and the Washington Post. They are speaking to an American audience, they're very interested in pleasing an American audience. And so the consequence of that in development and policy in all of these areas is something that is completely disconnected from the local context. It's almost as if you are, yeah, you're, you're, you're playing the role of, a, of some kind of satellite uh, sort of colonial thing. <laughs> So Ilham, do they have? Do they? Are you saying that they have an inferiority complex? Are you talking about the elites? I mean, the the, the new the the. Are you talking about the rulers? Are you talking about the, the educated elites? I mean, they may be the same thing. Do they have an inferiority complex that is that continues from the previous era? I mean, so I'm trying because in the there was a moment in the 50s and 60s where there was a sense of development, a sense of national. I mean, OPEC comes out of this period as well, that there was a sense of redirecting national resources to national development, tied, of course, to, to a sense of a wider, you know, global shift, uh, anti-colonialism, the question of Palestine, and so on. And you're saying that all that shifted now in the era that we're in now, which is much more neoliberal economics, privatization of these national health cares, and so on and so forth. But First of all, how, how is that? So the one question is the inferiority question that you sort of alluded to now. The second question is that I have, and these may be, take whichever one you want. These are not really, these are for you to answer as you wish. The second question is how, how does in places like Bahrain, where there's an actual population um, uh, of, you know, and, and of course it was the Arab Spring that, uh, or Kuwait or, or other places with populations or Oman, how does this neoliberal shift, this cutting back on, on what the Gulf was used to be famous for, which is having all these these this the money to invest in in national health, in better infrastructure, and so on and so forth. How does that get sold to people? 
at the same time as these same states are spending huge amounts of money on Western weaponry, mostly. So I'm wondering, do you see what I'm saying? So how, how, how is that sold to people? Right. So I think if you look in the past, you will see this effort by state leaders to, to belong to a regional context. And the influence of, of Arab nationalism definitely affected political parties and movements and anti-colonial movements. But I, I think it, it had its effect on state, on, on rulers as well. And I think the, the very clear, again, I, I go back to this example, but it is the clearest one, which is of Sheikh Zayed wanting to unite the seven emirates into a single country and wanting Bahrain and wanting Qatar to belong to this union. And these efforts that were made to try to push these countries into a single state, which if successful would have completely, of course, changed the course of things. I think we, my view is we would have all been better off as part of a larger federation. Um, whereas now, I think there's no sort of effort to integrate the region into itself. The GCC is, as, a, as a Gulf Cooperation Council is as weak as it's ever been. Um, instead, what you have is a much bigger drive to appease the United States um, and be seen as, you know, kind of reliable U.S. allies. Um, and I think yeah, the, the, the neoliberal shift that you that you talk about that you mentioned is definitely part of this. Um, it's sold as kind of a, a drive to become more modern. It's sold as part of a project to become more efficient. Um, to sort of stand out on the world stage. When you look at what the state is saying, even newspapers, things like that, I think in the past you would definitely get this rhetoric of Arabism. And 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 now it's about efficiency. It's about being on the map. It's about attracting investments and tourism. And I think if you were to ask many citizens, I'd say in Bahrain, I, 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 it's slightly different in the countries that are wealthier, where there's a bigger pie and we don't have pressures. Bahrain is one of the places where you do have pressures, you have fiscal pressures, uh, and because of that, you know, you have a much more uh, developed uh, political scene. Um, but how, how it gets sold is in terms of this kind of efficiency, modernity, that kind of language. Um, as people see their kind of social safety net chipped away, it's being sold in the name of progress. And so, and I'm, we want to, you know, as, we, as we're kind of moving along, and, you know, you've, you've set this really kind of convincing and, and, and coherent history that you've gone through, including this, the, the ebb and flow of relations with, with Palestine and Palestinians and the measure more generally, Lebanon, uh, Egypt, these kinds of countries. We, we've, you know, we're kind of entering now into that phase where we want to talk about this other big point, of course, which is the Abram Accords, which, of course, you, you've, you, you've written this whole book that's going to be coming out very soon. Uh, and... You know, heading towards what comes to be the Gaza genocide, and and what what is a kind of this big shift again in in Gulf relations. So, if two thousand six represents a kind of low point in 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 as I understand it, in their fear, in a kind of insecurity, because Iran on the one hand, and then a few years later you have and Lebanon, the kind of you know the rise of Hezbollah in in this part and connected to the Iranian project as they see it. Uh, and at this end, what's going on in Iraq at the same time, and then Arab uprisings, you get the kind of Muslim brothers coming to power. And so there's this, this sense of insecurity that, that's, that, that comes along during this period. Would you then say that the Abraham Accords, or what, what ends up being, so th there's a dislike for Obama at a certain level. Then when Trump comes and he kind of undoes the, the Iran nuclear deal, um, he kind of hits... Uh, Qasem Soleimani, he hits, you know, so they, 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 they go through this, this, uh, uh, you know, anti-Iranian kind of phase, which of course continues, but I mean, you know, go into this anti-Iranian phase um, and leading towards what comes to be these Abraham Accords, this normalization. Is this now a point where, uh, at least from the Gulf view, is it a point where the insecurity starts to go away? in the sense of that everybody there, and uh, my brother said, just reminded me, like people like Jake Sullivan and the American administration, others said, well, on October 6th and October 5th and October 4th, everything was fine. The situation was great. It was very clear that the Saudis were, I mean, as far as I'd heard, the, the, in March of 2024 was when there was supposed to have been, you know, earmarked more or less for when the Saudis and the Israelis were going to sign a deal, normalization deal. So everything was fine. And Palestine was not important. Palestinians were not important. And everything would fold into this extension of the Abraham Accords that would reach its final point with the Saudi kind of deal. And everything then opens up and everything's fine. 
is, is this how, so where is the security insecurity part in, in, in this? And where are the Palestinians and Palestine in this equation? I think there's there's no doubt that the accords were initially driven by this insecurity towards Iran. Um, under the Trump administration, I think there's a whole story to be told there about how this administration facilitated the, facilitated the rapprochement um, between, you know, it's not just UAE, Israel, but also Saudi is kind of integral to kind of these general conversations around Iran and where the region needs to go and the mistakes Obama made and what Trump can, can do better and, and uh, and the two sides, you know, eventually coming together under this administration. Um, I don't think that insecurity has gone away at all. I think the, 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 the point of having kind of the Abraham Accords was to add another partner to the roster formally. So, um, you know, to add Israel onto kind of as, as I think seen as kind of an additional layer to kind of the U.S. umbrella that they're already under. And yeah, they remain deeply insecure. I think a lot of a lot of the the decisions that are made are come out of this insecurity. But this insecurity hasn't gone away by any means. The Abraham Accords haven't resolved the insecurity at all. In fact, there's now kind of another insecurity that's coming into this, which is not wanting to provoke Iran too much. Oddly enough, whereas that was like the driver of the Abraham Accords initially. Um, I think now they're in a phase where since 2020, the relationship with Iran has what is what they are calling de-escalating, right? So Saudi now has formal relations with Iran. The UAE is on, is on a much better track with Iran than it used to be. Um, and with Gaza, I think they've been signaling as well to some extent this desire not to upset that too much. So, I mean, that's kind of, you know, you can, you can call it symbolic, but I, I think there's something there again, at least, at least to note. Um, the Red Sea coalition uh, that the U.S. started to to kind of uh, target the Houthis again, uh, the UAE and Saudi were not part of that and sort of deliberately did not want to send that message to Iran that they're part of this. At the same time, both countries have also kind of told the U.S. at least um, in private uh, not to strike Iran using their territories, uh, that they would want to avoid that. So there's still this kind of, obviously this, this you know, this, this yeah, the insecurity is still there. It's just it's manifesting in, in different ways, maybe than it used to. Ilham, can you just spell out for the for our viewers and listeners a little bit more about the Abraham Accords? And because I think we've all heard the term, but most people are not necessarily familiar with all the. Are there? There's a security aspect to this. Can you tell us spell out what it actually is? And uh, is there you know are there secret annexes that we're not aware of, and so on and so forth? I mean, whatever. Maybe just educate our listeners and viewers. The Abraham Accords is the formal name for the normalization agreement that took place between the UAE and Israel um, in August 2020, and which Bahrain joined a month later in September 2020, and in the months after that, Morocco and Sudan, although I, I don't really work on either of those, those, those two very much. Um, but that's the formal name of the agreements, and it just refers to the normalization process. Um, it's the establishment of diplomatic relations between the two sides which has enabled um, all sorts of other cooperation after that. Do they have a preamble like Camp David about the Palestinian question and so on and so forth, or no? The agreements are very, very short. Um, they barely make any reference to the Palestinians. Of course, that's deliberate. Um, I think they were born out of this um, very prevalent view at the time that, you know, the, the Palestinian question is not solvable um, and that the best you could do is sort of shrink the conflict or ignore the conflict or something like that. And that um, bypassing the Palestinians, in fact, uh, to make peace with, with Israel was, was the way to go. Um, so I think it's rather than trying to deal with the Palestinian question, resolve it in any way, as had been sort of the way things were moving in the past, this was the real culmination of, of actually efforts to avoid it, which is what the Trump administration wanted to do. It's what the Arab partners had agreed to do. And it's definitely what Israel and under Netanyahu for years had been, had been looking to do and successfully accomplished through the accords. Absolutely. So at the state level, I think we can start with Saudi Arabia. I think, you know, its official policy hasn't changed as much as there's been talk around Saudi willing to normalize and being very eager to normalize. For, for an exchange for you know very little, Saudi's position formally has remained the same. Um, they uh, sort of refuse to entertain statehood at least publicly without a two-state solution or without what they're calling now sort of 
irreversible progress on, on Palestinian statehood. In addition to that, they've made several domestic asks, which is civilian nuclear technology, their own missile defense systems, um, or to get missile defense systems from the U.S., um, and uh, and security guarantees from the U.S. So Saudi Arabia has has made plenty of asks in exchange for normalization. And I think even if we look at that instrumentally, I think we can understand it as more of a of a recognition of its of its status and how important Saudi normalization would be to Israel in continuing this project of normalization. It would be absolutely the icing on the cake and kind of having the biggest or one of the most influential Arab states on board would be huge. So I think Saudi Arabia, if for no other reason than kind of wanting to secure sort of the most for itself, is is committed to having something in return. And none of its asks are simple or straightforward. The security path to the United States is not simple or straightforward. That would have to go through Congress. Um, it's not at all guaranteed that it would. This rhetoric on Palestinian statehood, I think, there have been many efforts to challenge this or a lot of belief that this is insincere. But the reality is that we don't know that. There is nothing coming from Saudi officials that has confirmed that they are, are willing to kind of abandon that ask or dilute it substantially. Um, and so this is this is where we stand. And I would I would see this as another continuation of sort of the usual difference between Israeli discourse and uh, sort of other discourses. Whereas, you know, what you see often in Israel is leaders is uh, state leaders portraying things as a fait accompli. Uh, it's, it goes back to this idea of them saying over the years that we've always had relations with the Arab states. Arab states are very keen to normalize with us. I would see this as partly a continuation of that. Um, there's a real effort to kind of downplay anything that is, uh, you know, favorable to the Palestinians. Um, and so I, I do have questions on whether Saudi would commit to that, but for the time being, they haven't walked away from it, and it's significant. That's is there, Ilham, is there opposition to normalization in the Gulf, like right now as a result? Is it more pronounced now than before? I mean, I'll be, I would assume there is, but I don't know. No, there is huge opposition to normalization. And I think this is one of those things that is just not visible from the outside. Um, but from the inside, it is very clear and you can measure it in, in real tangible ways. So first of all, there's a boycott um, happening of corporations, mostly U.S. corporations that are seen as, as supportive of Israel. Um, you know, on the kind of across social media, and, and I have to say this is this has been really impressive. People are educating themselves and posting all kinds of content on the boycott on what companies should be avoided, and there have been tangible results. So McDonald's and Starbucks both reported declines in their in their profits over the last few months um, due to this boycott in the region. Um, in with, in the case of McDonald's specifically, it, I, I don't know if you have heard this over there that they've um, bought back their Israel franchises uh, due to the Arab boycott. Um, so there's been real, uh, it's had an effect in that sense. Um, there are protests in the states that allow protests. So in Bahrain, every Friday there are protests organized by an organization called the Bahrain Society Against Normalization with the Zionist Enemy. This is one of um, three BDS or, or, or uh, yeah, BDS basically um, societies. This one was set up in the Second Intifada and it's continued its work since then. It does so. Um, publicly, it does so with licensing from the government. So those protests happen every week. Um, and I think significantly, you can also look at polling data, which is going to confirm the same sentiments. Um, even WINEP, so the Washington Institute for Near East Policy, carried out this poll of, of Saudis, um, finding, I think this was in December of 2023, and it found that 96% of Saudis oppose normalization, oppose Arab normalization with Israel. So it's a huge number, and it found a fourfold increase in support for Hamas since, since October 7th. These are really, really significant numbers. Um, I think across the board as well, if you look at polling data, even, even using WINEP's figures, support for normalization is, is not at a high in the Gulf states. It hovers somewhere on 20%. Um, and I think I would also bear in mind, you know, when looking at these numbers, that there are many people who don't want to express uh, opposition to state policy. So if asked, they're not going to necessarily be honest. But I think to have support be around the 20% range is, just shows you that it's not really there. It's also This is also visible, by the way, in tourism figures. Um, so if you look at the number of Israelis visiting the UAE, um, tens of thousands all the time, um, 
especially in the first months after normalization. If you look at the number of Emirati nationals and Bahrainis visiting Israel, it's almost non-existent. In the case of Bahrain, it's almost non-existent. In the case of the UAE, again, it's a very, very small number. And these are, these are according to numbers Isra- released by Israel's own Ministry of Tourism. So they're not even uh, numbers from the side. They're numbers from, from Israel, effectively. So there is really very little appetite uh, for normalization in the Gulf among, among Gulf nationals. I think this is this is a perfect place to end, and it, it is kind of coming for full circle. Um, Iran was, I think you can easily say, was the main driver of the relationship from 2006 onwards, and that was at kind of the very low point between the Gulf-Iran relationship. Where we are now is in a different place. So 2020 onwards, there has been this process of rapprochement uh, between the Gulf states and Iran. So you had in uh, the, the Saudi and Iran restoring the relationship last year, Ahead of that, there were many positive kind of indications of, of visits and things like that. Even the UAE and Iran are in a much better place than they used to be. And if, you know, the traditional wisdom around this is that the Gulf states have kind of looked at the U.S. and come to realize that even at their worst point, um, the U.S. was not going to come to their aid. So, for example, in the 2019 um, attacks against Saudi Aramco, or there were these attacks against tankers off the coast of the UAE. During this very low point of 2019, even the Trump administration did not necessarily sort of come to their aid, uh, as, is, as is often said. And so there was very much this realization that actually the U.S. may not be able to solve all of the problems of the region. It's not necessarily interested in doing so. They have their own calculations. They're not, you know, they're, they're looking to kind of pivot to China and all of that. So they started to develop this deliberate policy of actually trying to repair the relationship with Iran. And the combination of that, as we saw, was the restoration of diplomatic relations between Saudi and Iran and then between the UAE and Iran as well, more recently. And I think what's been very interesting about this event since October 7th is seeing how the Gulf states are really committed to that. So in many ways, they have signaled to the U.S., as I mentioned earlier, this desire that they don't want to antagonize Iran again. They don't want to be caught in the middle of kind of this broader war, and they'll do what they can in their capacity to de-escalate. I think this is very, very interesting when thinking about it in terms of the Israel relationship, because I think what many expected was the Gulf states to fully come on board with Israel and prioritize that relationship ahead of any other. But I think what they're increasingly trying to do at this point is balance it with the relationship they have with Iran, because they also see that as being crucial to sort of regional stability and all of that. Um, the last thing they want right now is to see the region uh, get drawn into to a much bigger conflict than what we already have. Um, and so I think to some extent, this is how we are seeing the breaks being applied to the Israel relationship, or at least a way of wanting to balance it out with the one with Iran. And I think this, this way of thinking is what is going to guide the way forward. Um, I think the Biden administration has been really, really pushing Saudi normalization. Um, But I think there are a lot of reasons why that's not going to be as easy as they think. Um, Least of all, Saudi not wanting to hand them an easy victory in exchange for nothing. I I do think that Saudi is is very serious about getting something in return, at least if not for themselves, or at least if, if not everything that they're asking for for the Palestinians, and at least something, and at least not, if not all of their domestic asks and some of them. So there's going to be a very long, drawn-out process when it comes to Saudi normalization. I don't think it's going to be as easy as the Biden administration expects. And I don't think the calculations of the Gulf states are as straightforward as they may have been a few years ago. There's definitely this desire to balance things out. And and this is what's going to inform the future trajectory of, of things, I think. Okay, guys. So what do you think? I thought this was a really illuminating kind of discussion about relations between the Gulf and and Palestine. And, and going, we went, we spent you know more time than i thought than i expected on this kind of the, the history of it and the you know but i thought that was actually quite interesting what did you guys think i thought it was i thought it was really 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 illuminating uh obviously i was particularly taken by the historical narratives and and you know i kept coming back to that that role because it's all part of our own history too that role of beirut as one of the central kind of loci for arab political thought and cultural thought and and then you know even technocratic stuff as well so that that shift from a sort of Beirut-centered Arab world, at least this part of the Arab world, Mashrit, to a kind of post, you know, post Lebanese post Lebanese civil war, post nineteen ninety, the reordering of all these things, I thought was really, really interesting. And that they, 
the all the educational links that used to that used to bring the Gulf elites to Lebanon for education, and then would, then would send also Lebanese educated, Beirut educated, Lebanese and Palestinian intellectuals and and bureaucrats and technocrats and so forth to the Gulf to basically run the place, shifting to this kind of post I don't know as she said like post nineties or nineties onwards. You know, where they, where they, where they now they look to, to America, to, you know, to, for inspiration, and then they companies like McKinsey and so forth come in and and, and help them with their, with their stuff. And Tony Blair and all these kind of you know uh, ill favored uh, people, as far as I'm concerned. So that yeah, I thought that was really really interesting. Samba, what did you think? Yeah, I agree with you guys, and I think it's it raised some some she raised uh, Ilham raised many interesting questions and points that we've. That we've discussed sort of tangentially in, on all our podcasts, the question of what are interests like what are and we're going to talk about this, of course, with with future guests as well. H- how do you define a national interest as opposed to dynastic interest? What about popular pressures in the Gulf? This whole tradition of anti-colonialism and, and a real identification, as she said, time and again, with Palestine historically and even contemporaneous, like going on all the way till now. Uh, and yet you have, uh, as she charted, this kind of this sort of tentative, embarrassed, sort of initial rapprochement in the 1990s around the Oslo Accords to a more sort of aggressive post-2003 U.S. invasion of Iraq and 2006 and 2006 with the Iran nuclear program at Hezbollah. Uh, and then eventually the, the extraordinary vulgarity of the, the, the Abraham Accords and the total marginalization of the Palestinians. And so that, that whole discussion was, was, I thought, very interesting. And that narrative was interesting. The question that still remains is, to what extent do these states actually have, you know, to what extent do we have to disaggregate the states with populations, with huge popular pressures, um, as opposed to the states that, that, that are essentially just dynasties? And then what about the states? What about Israel? Like the relationship between ultimately Israel, as the, we've talked about this as well on our podcast, the, the, the tail that wags the dog, as opposed to, these other states, these Gulf states that that need Israel, that's the interesting thing. They need Israel to get to the U.S., which I found extraordinary. Um, and the whole relationship, they're actually... If you want influence in Washington, you have to go to Tel Aviv to get influence in Washington. I, I don't know it's if that's... I don't know, but she was saying no, right, Karim? She was saying at the end, that's that's less the case. I don't know. Maybe I'm wrong. Yeah, that's that's what I was pressing at the end. And I think at home, from from what I understood, I think she she seemed to agree with this, that... that what, what we're seeing now is maybe another shift. So if between 2006, this kind of fear of Iran and Hezbollah and this kind of thing threw them wholly into the, into the kind of American and therefore Israeli basket, which kind of culminates into the Abraham Accords, which itself was supposed to culminate into the Saudi kind of final Saudi normalization deal in which the Palestine question is, is sidelined or just kind of you know, incorporated into that. There would be money, there would be things that would be thrown at them. And the PA would be, you know, and this kind of thing. You'd end up more now with the with this this clear military, uh, the, the the lack of capability that the Israelis have, the fact that you have that they're under, they're clearly not gaining, they're losing. I'm not talking about the genocide and, of course, the civilian, uh, you know, the carnage that they so enjoy doing, but more. At, at the military side, unable to defeat Hamas, unable to defeat Hezbollah, unable to, to deal with the Yemenis, with, you know, it's, it's incredible what's going or on. Or let alone Iran. Okay, we're not even talking about Iran. I'm not, even, not even talking about Iran. We're talking about I- Iraq. But Karim Sadi, I'm wondering. Yeah, and Iraq, etc. So all, all, all this, so just to finish the point, all of this is indicating that, that you're, you know, you're in a situation where, where they are re, under, where they're, they're, they're reconceptualizing what it means to, what their security means. And they're understanding that they have to shift away, certainly from the Israeli basket, as a like, oh, we, we need them. They now see themselves, well, okay, you know, we either have direct connections to America, maybe they're waiting for Trump to come back, and they're also putting their eggs in other baskets, like China and, and, and those other actors that are outside there, understanding that you can't kind of get out of the Middle East without also ensuring that there's at least a very basic uh, you know, resolution to the question of Palestine vis-a-vis their own population. So it, it, there's, there seems to be a shift away. And this is what's interesting and kind of uh, uh, t- trying to, 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 to kind of resuscitate ties with Iran, understanding that the only real regional deals to be made are with the Iranians. Also, I mean, and to add to what you're saying, Karim, I agree with, with what you said 100%. But also this, this, this question that, that, that 
is so striking is that these these extraordinarily vulgar normalization the, the Abraham Accords the this kind of disgraceful actually Accords uh, are all with the most extremist Israeli government in history that, that's the amazing thing and that the genocide that's going on now is happening so I keep wondering at, at what extent do these Gulf states even the monarchs and the despots I mean to what extent a are all these accords premised on the suppression? And that's what we were trying to push her a little bit on. It's They're based on the suppression and repression of a long history of solidarity with Palestine. It's not even democracy. It's just a sense of, of being Arab but being Muslim, a sense of just identification. So there's that there's that aspect and the crushing of the Arab Spring, of course. I think she was trying to disaggregate it. I think she was trying to, dis- I think Ilham was trying to disaggregate a little bit between those two. Between, but, which two? Okay, sorry, clarify. Yeah, but the statistics that she had sorry, the poll that she had about the Saudis, whatever, 90 something percent of Saudis being against normalization. That's that's telling or 96 percent. I think she said something like that. It's it's very telling. Well, who wants to be normalizing with like a state that's carrying out genocide on, on all their social media? They can see it on their social media. That's the thing. But um, I guess I guess the question ultimately is 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 to see where and how the, these Gulf states and monarchs and the the what what I don't understand is don't they see that Israel is actually a destabilizing factor for them? That's why Kenny man, I mean, you're you're the, you're of all the three of us, you're the one who's the most sort of attuned to these kind of geopolitical questions. No, but that's what I'm saying. I, I I think now it seems to be clearer, and I think it'll become clearer that the Israelis are loose cannons, that they're not only militarily unable to defeat even something like Hamas on their doorstep let alone Hezbollah, let alone uh, Yemen, let alone Iran. And they're entirely unreliable on, on all levels, except as a way hey, ex- except as a, as a way that you get to Washington, as a way is this kind of thing. The question is, do they still need them to get to Washington? Do they still need them to get to America? Do they need them to go to China? Do they need them to kind of expand in the way that they see well, them? They don't need them to go to China, that's for sure. They, they need them to get to the U.S., yes. I think this is going to be. I think this is going to be a turning point. I think what happened in Gaza, and what happened in, in Gaza, I think is going to be a turning point for the way in which the Israelis are perceived everywhere, and for the idea that it's clear that they cannot protect themselves. And this is going to have impact on how regional security, you know, systems and and understandings are going to progress. Which is why they're so desperate to to, to destroy Hamas. It's, it's why Blinken and, and, and all these guys, all these horrible Americans and Israelis are, are desperate. They, they want to stop a regional war, but they're desperate to crush Hamas because they want to remove that point and, and restore this notion that the Israelis can defeat their enemy and they can use the military to defeat. That's why they're so, so desperate for that. That's an interesting point, actually, that you just made. That's, a, that's actually, it's actually one of the most, it reminds me of what Richard Falk said to us earlier, which is that Israel can't win, but it can't afford to lose. And, and sort of, so what you're saying is, is it's a, you're restating that same point, but in a, in a more sort of a more horrific way, which is to say that they need Hamas to be destroyed, no matter how long it takes and how many Palestinians get slaughtered and killed. This is going to so basically what you're saying is that this is going to go on. You're saying for months more, the genocide will continue. In their minds, yeah. If they can, if they can help, but of course it will. Of course, I'm not sure it will. But they're paying a very, very heavy price. But they're paying a price for it. It's not scot free. Who's paying a price? You know, not they don't care about the the inhumanity. The Israelis are also paying a price, and yes. all kinds of like this 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 kind of the Israelis this is about twenty seven billion dollars. Whatever. First of all, that most of that goes to the big weapons makers in 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 in, in California. It doesn't go to them. But but nevertheless, yes, of course, they're being given extra extra leash to play with. But the point is. They're also paying, there's a massive economic price that they're paying. There's a massive political price that they're paying. And then, by the way, the other thing, the other cost that, that's, that they're paying here is that the emperor has no clothes and everybody can see it now, which is for them, they, they always relied on there being a well clothed emperor that everybody thought, wow, these guys, they have deterrence, yeah, no, they're that's a good dangerous, point. they can do whatever, and nobody could say no. They've lost all that now. It's what they're doing is, it's not just inhuman, it's stupid, but that's a whole other story. Okay, guys, I think we should stop here. And uh, say thank you. Thank you. And we'll see you. Thank you. See you later. Thanks, everybody. Thanks to Adham again. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye.